spent about 10 or 13 weeks going through the book of 1 Peter um, together, uh, but I will give you a brief overview of it so then that way you have it along with all the others, um, and we'll, we'll keep on going. So we don't have that many books left. Um, after 1 Peter, we have the three Johns, uh, Jude and the Revelation, and we'll have that done. And so um, I've, I'll prepare and I'll bring next week, I'm going to hand out a little, a little card that's for question and answers. So I'll hand those out, and um, if you have a Bible question or something of that nature, you can write it down, hand it back to me, and then we'll have, when we're done with this, we'll have at least one Sunday where we'll do like a question and answer time. Um, but rather than doing it a live question and answer time, we'll do it where you submit your questions in advance, and we'll go over the answers to those questions. Um, that just generally helps get a better answer, okay? Um, top of my head is okay sometimes, but there are some questions that's better to be able to do a little bit of studying on and give a good answer. All right, so that we'll do that coming up. All right, now, the book of 1 Peter. As we look at it, um, an introduction, 1 and 2 Peter are end time books. Right? They're end time books. They deal with Christian living in light of the soon return of Jesus. Okay. And both epistles seem to be directed towards Hebrew Christians, Jews who've been dispersed due to persecution. Look at 1 Peter um, chapter 1, verse 1. Peter, uh, an apostle of Jesus... Christ, the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, uh, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Right? So they, they seem to be addressed primarily to a Hebrew Christian audience, um, but we also know it's the word of God, so it's applicable to anyone, correct? And so we, we need to remember that. And um, it's more than, than just this group may have been addressed in the second epistle. So the second epistle may not be just the Hebrew Christians, more than just that group may be addressed, but ultimately it applies to everyone. And uh, 1 Peter has five chapters, 105 verses, and roughly 2,482 words. If you're interested in that count, you've been doing it uh, with each book of the New Testament. And the author, guess who wrote 1 Peter? Wouldn't it be funny if it wasn't Peter? <laughs> I'm sorry, like it's, I think that would be ironic and that'd be fun just to Maybe that's why I'm not God, because I would have had probably a little bit <laughs> anyways. Uh, there's probably a lot of reasons why I'm not God, okay? That's just we'll leave it there. Uh, they, <laughs> the author is Peter, right? The author is Peter. Now, there's some interesting things about Peter uh, that we'll look at this morning. Number one, the New Testament gives more biographical information of Peter than any other apostle. We know more about his background. We know more about his family. Hey, we know Peter was married. Correct? Mm -hmm. Contained within the Bible. We say, why? Jesus raised his mother-in-law from the dead. Or from, not from the dead, but from being sick. And let me just say, you've got to be pretty dumb to have a mother-in-law not get a wife in the deal. Okay? Uh, that's just fair. I mean, you no, know, you can like your mother-in-law, that's fine, you know. But still, if you're going to get a mother-in-law, if you're going to get another mom, you want a wife over here, right? Probably. Yeah, hopefully. So we know he was married. Uh, we know he was, you know, Simon Bar Jonas. We know a lot of things about him that we don't know about um, other apostles. There is no other Peter in the New Testament. Which is kind of interesting, because it's easy to track him in the New Testament. There's no other Peter. 
Okay? So whenever you see Peter in the New Testament, guess who it's speaking of? It's Peter. You know? um, it's not like Judas. There's a lot of them in the New Testament. Judas not Yeah, there's Judas not Iscariot, there's Judas Iscariot, there's on and on we can go. Um, there's other names within the Bible that there are many of. Uh, there's many forms of, of Joshua, uh, of Jesus. We, we know Joshua, Jesus, and Hosea are all derived from the same wording background. Right? So, anyways, um, he heads the list of apostles in all four Gospels. And all four Gospels that will record the listing of the apostles, Peter's always named first. And if you've ever noticed when they list the apostles, they're always listed in groups of three. You know, Peter, James, and John, right? Usually the first one is like the leader of that group of three. If you, if you study it out throughout scripture and you, you see how it goes, usually the first one in the group of three kind of is a sort of leader of the three. But in every listing, the first disciple listed is Peter. Right? He was the first to confess that Jesus was the Son of God. Remember when Jesus said, Whom do men say that I am? Well, some say you're Elias, and some say you're this one, and some say you're this one. Well, who do you say that I am? Who was the one that piped up and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God? Peter. He was the very first disciple to declare. Um, and confess that Jesus was the Son of God. Oh, it's off the screen. Well, he was the first disciple to enter into Christ's tomb, empty tomb. You can't see it, but that's what he says. Remember, he and John took off running. John stopped at the entrance of the tomb, and Peter just didn't stop. Straight in. Right, he was the first one in there. He was the first disciple to be called by name by Christ after his resurrection. Remember, Jesus told them, you know, told, I think it was Mary Magdalene, go tell my disciples and Peter. Right, so he was the first one by name after Christ's resurrection. And he is referred to 210 times in the New Testament. <laughs> He's referred to a lot in the New Testament. Of course, there are many other familiar things that you know about Peter, but these are the only two books which he wrote. Right? One and two Peter are the only books within the canon of scripture that Peter wrote. Alright, so that's some information about Peter. Now, it was written around 60, AD 64 to 65. And it was written during the during uh, Nero's persecution. So that sort of hey, you know how we spent all that time talking about walking through trials and dealing with Suffering and some difficulties and all that type of stuff as we looked at the book of 1 Peter on Wednesday nights? Does that put that in a little bit more context of do you think Peter suffered and the Christians Peter was writing to suffered a little bit of suffering if Nero was the emperor at the time of it was written? Oh, big time suffering, right? Um, that's Christians were used as human torches in Nero's garden. Um, don't know about you, but I, I'd rather not do that. Uh, it's interesting to note that Peter was probably executed by Nero soon after. Soon after the penning of these books, he was executed by Nero. Not physically by Nero, but Nero gave the command. Okay? Tradition polls. Now, you understand when we say tradition, we're saying that like, this is not the word of God. But when you study Jewish history or even just regular history or you look at some of like Josephus' writings and people who were alive during this time, that's what we mean by tradition. 
um, holds that he was crucified upside down because he felt unworthy to be crucified in the same way his Savior was. Okay, so Jesus was crucified like normally. And so when they crucified Peter, they put the cross upside down. So his head was facing the ground and his feet were facing the air. Okay, so that's what tradition holds uh, with him. Theme of the book. Triumph through trials. Triumph through trials. The common thread that is woven through each chapter is the sufferings of Christ and the suffering as a Christian. Woven through every chapter, you'll find something you know to do with the sufferings of Christ and our sufferings as a Christian. And just as surely as Christ triumphed over every trial, he assures us final victory. Okay? In the end, we win. We're victorious. Right? I mean, ultimately, in the end, Christ wins the final victory, and we head off into eternity with new heaven and new earth and new Jerusalem and uh, with him forever. So, in the end, we have final victory. Now, the key words, suffering. Suffer, suffering, some form of suffer, is used 15 times. And there are two major sections in this book, okay? Section one, um, is chapter 1, verse 1, and chapter 4, verse 11, and it ends with a benediction. Then the second section of this book is chapter 4, verse 12, and chapter 5, verse 14. Say, so why are you saying that? Well, because the key passages start, are found, the key verses, if you'd say, are found at the beginning of each section of the book. Okay? So, the first key verses is chapter 1, verses 6 to 9. So let's look at chapter 1, verse 6 to 9. It says, Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than, than of gold, that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found in the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen ye love, and whom though now ye see him not, yet believing ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. All right, the next one is found at the beginning of the second section. And it's chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. For the eyes of the... Uh, no, that's chapter 3. Chapter 4. All right. 12 and 13. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice in as much as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. And so different things about suffering and the purpose of suffering and, and how it works in us and tries us and makes us more like him and um, you know the opposite of what we would normally think. We should be rejoicing and joyful in suffering. I know that's hard sometimes, isn't it? Isn't that one of the hard things to obey in Scripture? That even when you're going through a difficult time, just still be joyful. Sometimes you're going through a difficult time and you think, what do I have to be joyful for? Uh, but, you know, uh, the scripture is true. Because no matter what we're going through circumstantially here on this earth, we are still completing Christ. Uh, we still have security. And so, uh, there's a lot to be joyful for. Now, the outline. Number one, the suffering of Christ 
and what they brought. The suffering of Christ and what they brought. So that's chapter 1. Um, it brought us hope. It brought us hope. In chapter 1, look at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And then verse 13. Wherefore, grip the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And again in verse 21. Who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. So the suffering from what they brought, it brought us hope, right? And then it brought us several incorruptible things. Several incorruptible things is what this suffering brought us. So look at... Um, Let's see. Look at verse Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, and strangers scattered throughout, uh, should be verse 1 and 2, throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit, and the obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace be unto you, and peace be multiplied. So what did it bring us? It brought us an inheritance. An incorruptible inheritance, right? Um, it's an exciting thing. Look at verses 18 and verse 19. For as much as you know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, for your vain conversations received by traditions from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So we received an incorruptible redemption. It wasn't purchased with corruptible things. It was purchased with incorruptible things. And in verse 23, verse 23, it says, Seeing ye have purified your souls and obeying the truth, uh, no, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. All right, so there's those things. Number two, the suffering of Christ and what we bear. The suffering of Christ and what we bear. Look at chapter 2, verses 21 to 23. By the way, that's in chapter 2. So chapter 2, verses 21 to 23. For when, for even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example, that ye should follow his steps who who did no sin neither was God found in his mouth and so the suffering of Christ and what we bear um, you know for example verse 9 tells us we're peculiar uh, we must war against worldly lusts verse 11 tells us that and we occasionally will suffer wrongfully we're told that in chapter 2 verse 19 so some of the things we bear and then number three, the suffering of Christ and how we behave. Suffering of Christ and how we behave. Look at verse 18 of chapter 3. For Christ also has once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickening by the Spirit. So how should we live? Well, we should live dead in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. All right? How do we behave? Well, how we behave at home. If you look at verses 1 to 7, that gives you some information on that. How you behave in a church setting. And uh, it's not always, it's not all in there, but, and then how we behave in the world. All right? 
main points are there. Then number four, the suffering of Christ and what we believe. What we believe. Chapter 4, verse 1, For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourself likewise with the same mind, for he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. All right. We see a man suffers for uh, a man who suffers for Christ glorified God. We see the man who suffers for Christ will be will know glory in this life now and eternity we see in that chapter all right number five it's chapter five uh, the suffering of christ and what will be the suffering of christ and what will be chapter five verse ten says but the god of all grace who have called us unto his eternal glory by christ jesus after that ye have suffered a while make you perfect establish strengthen settle you the suffering of Christ and what will be. And then Christ in the book. Well, we see um, we see a suffering Savior, obviously. All throughout the book, we see a suffering Savior. And then Peter challenges us to follow his steps. We read that in chapter 2, verse 21. So we're encouraged to follow his steps. Right. Now, there in our Bible, so let's flip over to 2 Peter, and we will continue on. And you'll find as we get into 2 Peter, um, it bears close resemblance to the book of Jude. So just when we look at 2 Peter, and then when we look at the book of Jude, there's a lot of close resemblance to the two books, okay? Um, one may have influenced the other. Both the subject matter and phraseology are similar. Okay, so when you look at it, maybe not in English, but in the original, like, Koine Greek, the way things are phrased and stuff are very similar. So they're, 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 they're very, you know, sub, and then what they talk about is very similar. Um, so they're not sure which one influenced the other, or if they influenced each other at all, or we do know it was inspired by God. All right? It would be helpful to make a close comparison between the two. So if you ever want to say the book of Jude, you know, study the book of 2 Peter with it, and study them side by side, if you compare the two, um, it'd be an, it's an interesting study if you are so inclined to want to do that. Uh, they both deal with apostasy in the last days. So both of them will deal with apostasies in the last days. And the book has three chapters, 61 verses, and about 1,559 words. So it's a, it's a small book, but we're going to start getting into the Johns and they get in, and into Jude and they get smaller. But here we are. To Peter. All right, so jumping into the author, uh, 2 Peter 1, verse 1. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And then again, the last chapter in chapter 3, verse 1. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you in both which I stir up your pure mind by way of remembrance. And so we see the Apostle Peter um, as being the author. Four little facts about the book and the author. One, uh, this is the last letter, and interesting enough, it bears a close resemblance in tone to Paul's last letter. Okay? So this is the last thing he writes. And there's a lot of things that Peter says in his closing remarks and stuff that are a lot like what Paul does in 2 Timothy, because 2 Timothy is Paul's last book. All right, so there are some similarities in this book and a couple of books here. 
Martyrdom is near for both men. So when Paul wrote to Timothy and Peter wrote to Peter, they were both approaching fastly their death. And they both were martyred. They were killed for their faith. Uh, they both give a warning to believers for the last days. Okay, They both do. And they both see the word of God as the only solution to apostasy. You say, how do you battle apostasy? The word of God. What's the solution to false teaching? The word of God. And that's, that's consistently what we're told is, you know, this is how you battle it. Let's teach the word. All right, the date. Sometime between AD 66 and 67. 66 and 67. So about a year or so after 1 Peter. Peter writes this epistle as an old man. And by, by this time, death is imminent. Right? So I don't know if you've talked to many people who are dying and they know they're dying. Uh, usually their last words are carry some weight, right? Um, their, their last things they want to leave to you and tell you and um, all those types of things. So that's, that's what's going on here. Now, the theme. Putting you in remembrance. Say, what is the last thing Peter wanted to do? He wanted to say, hey, wake up and remember some things. Right? He just wants to put them in remembrance. Peter's goal is to remind believers of certain things which they already know. You can't be put in remembrance of something you don't know, correct? That's why sometimes, like, you read the Bible more than once. You say, why? Because you need to be reminded of some things you know. Yes? And that's why sometimes, like, I've heard messages from the exact same passage of Scripture back to back. And it's helped remind me of some things I already knew that I need to be rem reminded of, right? Um, and sometimes, you know, you can, you, you, if you're in, let's put it this way. If you're in church long enough, you may hear a passage preached more than once. Right? How many of you, in, in the time you've been in church, you've heard one, you know, certain passages of Scripture preached more than once? More than once by different preachers. More than once by the same preacher. In miniatures long enough, you're going to hear it. But guess what? That's exactly what Peter's saying. He said sometimes you need to be reminded of some things. You need to be reminded of some things that you already know so you don't forget them. Um, we may know things, but we must never forget them. It's the same reason why we have dates set aside even culturally in Australia like Anzac Day. Hey, we know about the Anzacs, but if we're not reminded about that, how easy it is to forget the past. Correct? Uh, we, we know about a lot of things, but unless we're reminded, why do you think Jesus established the Lord's Supper? Do we not know about the suffering and shed blood and broken body of Christ, what it did for us? Right? We know that, right? So why did he set it up? This do in remembrance. remembrance. By the way, uh, tonight in our evening service, um, we are having the Lord's Supper. It's the fifth Sunday. And the title of the message, uh, I'll you want to know the title of the message before you even come? What do we remember when we say, in rem and this do in remembrance of me? What are we remembering? All right, so we're going to look at some things we're remembering about when we say that every time. Because every time you take the Lord's Supper, we say, this do in remembrance of me, and then what do we do? We partake of that element, correct? Because that's in Scripture. Uh, so um, I was sitting there in my office this week, and I thought, what are we remembering when we say in remembrance of me? And I have a couple of thoughts and a couple of ideas that we're going to look at. All right, we'll be back in 1 Peter, by the way. Um, all right, so we must never forget them. 
Notice, remember is the only way to stay stirred up. Remembering is the only way to stay stirred up. That is, this is the great purpose of this book. The great purpose of 2 Peter is to cause us to be stirred up by remembering some things. Okay? Key word. Now, we're talking about remember, remember, remember. The key word you're going to say is? Remember. No. Um, no. Knowledge, known, knowing. Which, in essence, no is remembering what you know, right? You know, I mean, so it is the same, but it was just set up perfectly there for someone to go, remember, it's no, no, it's not that. Um, it's some form of this word, no, knowledge, known, knowing. Um, there are at least 14 references to these words in three chapters, okay? There's at least 14 references to know, knowledge, known, knowing in here. Uh, these are the days to know what you believe, know why you believe it, and hold to it. Okay? The days in which we are living right now are the days that we know what we believe, we know why we believe it, and we hold to what we believe. Too many things are changing. Too many things are being redefined. Hey, if you know what you believe, you know why you believe it, stick to it. Hold it. Don't budge. Scripture is still true. Right, key verse. Chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. So let's look at them. Chapter 3, verse 17 and 18. Yet ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also being led away with the air of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness. But grow in grace, and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to him be glory both now and forever. Amen. You see that? Uh, you know these things before. You say, hey, listen, everything I've told, basically what he's saying, everything I've told you in this book, you already know. You ever feel like someone's just repeating themselves? Peter, you know what Peter just said? I haven't told you anything new. I've just reminded you of them. That's what you already know. So if it sounds like reading this letter that I'm repeating myself, it's because I am. Isn't that basically what he's saying? He said, but I'm doing this so you don't fall away into error. Okay? The entire book builds up to this climatic reminder, warning, and instruction. Okay. Um, outline. Number one, he puts them in remembrance of what they have obtained to remind them of what they're obligated to. Okay? If you've obtained some things, they come with obligations. So what have they obtained? Well, they obtained precious faith. They have obtained peace. They've obtained power. They've obtained promise. They've obtained partaking in a divine nature. All that's obviously in chapter 1, because that's in chapter 1. So because they've obtained those things, they're obligated to add to their faith. And it's off the screen again. And they're obligated to make their calling and election sure. Right? So they, they obtain some things and they're obligated to some things. Number two, he puts them in remembrance of truth in chapter 1, verse 15 to verse 21, to remind them to take heed. He puts them in remembrance of truth to remind them to take heed. This section of scripture is a classic passage of scripture. It's, it's one that like we you should study, you should know. It's interesting. All right, number three, he puts them in remembrance of former judgments to remind them of future judgments on false prophets. You say, 
Oh, well, what do, you, what do you mean by that? Well, he, the former judgments he reminds them of in verse 4, chapter 2, he reminds them of the former judgments of angels. Okay? He reminds them of the world in Noah's day. In verse 5. Look at, uh, let's look at that real quick. Chapter 2, verse 4. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into the chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. So he's reminding them of the judgment of past angels, correct? Then go to verse 5. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, the preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the earth, upon the world of the ungodly. Okay, so he reminds them, hey, listen, I, I judged the world in Noah's day. And then he goes on with verse 6. And turned the seas of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly. So what is he saying? He's reminding them of God's judgment in the past to what? Assure them of God's judgment in the future. The future judgment of false prophets. He's saying, listen, if the angels who sinned didn't get by without judgment, and if the earth didn't get by without judgment in those days, and if some of the more didn't get by without judgment, don't think that the false prophets you're dealing with are going to get by without judgment. So he reminds them of these truths. And then number four, he puts them in remembrance of the destruction of the world to remind them of the day of the Lord. Right? Hey, listen, you know, chapter 3, he puts them in remembrance of the destruction of the world to remind them of the destruction of the world. Uh, and as he reminds them, he reminds them of the imminence of it, that it says a thief in the night, and the impact of it, of what manner of person you ought to, uh, ought you to be, he said. So uh, it's very interesting there. Now, Christ in the book. We see Christ as the transfigured one. And we see Christ as the long-suffering Lord. Why hasn't he returned? Well, he's long-suffering. Right. We see him as the long-suffering Lord. So there is the book of... 2 Peter, 1 and 2 Peter, so a little bit of a background there, and next week we'll uh, jump into the next book, which is 1 John, and uh, we'll see how that goes, uh, but 2 John and 3 John, uh, really just one chapter, 2 John, 3 John, and Jude are all one chapter books, so we need to take as long to get through them, I don't think, uh, but we're getting close to so hopefully, um, you'll be able to get a better view of these books and understanding of them. It'll be a help to you. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer, and then we'll have a time of fellowship uh, before the morning service. Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for this time you've given us once again to be together here and study your word. I pray now that you bless this time of fellowship, bless the food, and we're praying for the service this morning for the number of people that we. Uh, yet to get here, we pray for safety as they're still on the roads, and we will do the service this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.